We're in the Keystone Ancient Forest in Sand Springs, and joining me is Grant Gerondale. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a really uh, kind of hidden treasure here. Cool place, one of Tulsa's best kept secrets. 1,360 acres of what Sand Springs and this part of the world used to look like. Mm -hmm. And this has been protected, I would say, largely because it's, uh, you know, certainly we're not going to farm here. No, it's a <laughs> conservation effort first. Mm -hmm. I, I always like to tell people this is a, this is a, a nature preserve first, mm -hmm. a place to hike and enjoy second, in that order. Excellent. And how long has it been a preserve? It's fairly new. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's only been around really, if, if you look at the, the history of this project, it really goes back to the late 1990s with Dr. David Staley mm -hmm. and landowners and the Oklahoma chapter of the Nature Conservancy. And long story short, it's kind of a project in the making, but it is open. We've been open since uh, the fall of 2007. And uh, people have been coming out here hiking one day a month for the last several years and, and having a good time with it. Yeah, you're open um, to the public one day a month. One Saturday yeah, second, each month. Second Saturday okay. of each month from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. Mm -hmm. and uh, they've got trail guide, they've got volunteer trail guides out here that monitor the parking lot. They open mm -hmm. the property, close the property. In fact, they'll go out and hike with you if you've got some questions. A lot of them are kind of naturalists Excellent. on their own, so mm -hmm. they're very knowledgeable about the trees and the plants and the critters that are out here. So mm -hmm. it's a good time. Excellent. What would you say is the really the unique feature well, of Keystone Forest? What's neat about the forest is mm -hmm. only here do you have a combination of ecological history. You know, we have all of the history of our state's cross timbers forests. Mm -hmm. You have state history. You have Washington Irving coming through here in October of 1832, just a mile away mm -hmm. over the hill, uh, doing what what really turned out to be one of the one of the rare white man writings about what Oklahoma looked like. He was mm -hmm. a writer. He was the author of the day, and he came right through this part of the world in October of 1832. So you have this combination of ecological protection, Oklahoma history, human history, a little bit of Native American history, and it's all for you to come out and hike one day a month, free of charge, 12 months out of the year. What a wonderful combination. It is, and it, again, it's a project in the making. The trail we're on today, we hope to have this paved this year, and mm -hmm. there'll be more project uh, improvements coming over time. It's slow, we ask everybody's patience, but it's a project in the making, but I think they're gonna enjoy it over time. Very special place, and I'm so glad to have had the opportunity to visit. I know one of the features here, um, is that it's kind of an isolated area. We're mm -hmm. up on a, a ledge, so it was never, uh, forested for timber, it was never right. farmed, um, and there's also a lot of history with the fire, and it's just an interesting community. We're going to learn a little bit more about that. Uh, Sounds great. Okay, well, thank you. You bet. Thanks for coming out to the forest. We'll see you again. Joining me now is Matt Allen, a plant ecologist. Matt, I know you've uh, done extensive work in the cross timbers. Tell us a bit about uh, what characterizes this ecosystem. Well, the cross timbers is a, is a large system of forest. It's the biggest forest uh, type in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. uh, it stretches from southeast Kansas into uh, kind of north central Texas and is primarily characterized by two different uh, oak species, the post oak and blackjack oak mm -hmm. and uh, these two species really constitute probably about 99 percent of the trees you'll find in the forest um, these uh these two trees are can be relatively long-lived and, and here at the keystone ancient forest preserve we have a lot of of uh, old uh, post oak in particular yeah and i find it interesting you know in ancient forests when we think of an old growth forest we think of the giant sequoias and such um, Tell me, you know, these trees are obviously not that large, but we're in a drought habitat. I imagine that's mm -hmm. a big piece of that. Yeah, so these trees really have uh, very slow growth rates mm -hmm. in a lot of instances. Um, in particular, uh, I've seen examples where trees may grow less than a millimeter or two uh, in diameter in a, in a whole decade. And oh, wow. uh, so their, <laughs> their growth rate can really be quite suppressed uh, mm -hmm. depending on the particular uh, stresses of their growing location. What are some of the features we might look at a tree and say, yes, that's a really, you know, two or three hundred year old tree? What yeah. might we look for? Well, so the, there's no real conclusive diagnostic right. characters, but the main things you would look for is if you start to see sort of a twisting to mm -hmm. the bark as, uh, um, as the tree ages, uh, that spiral grain um, tends to become more pronounced and you can see it uh, more readily. Also, you'll often have kind of these heavy, more horizontal 
uh, spreading branches. Those are often an indicator of uh, age. And oftentimes you'll see a lot more broken limbs and dead limbs mm -hmm. and also just indicative of a tree getting older and aging. Yeah, they've been through a lot. Yeah, certainly. <laughs> How far did or does the cross timber habitat uh, extend? Uh, well, really, it, it stretches uh, really throughout the whole kind of eastern central portion of this of Oklahoma. Um, it has its northern range limit in northern Kansas and then down into northern Texas. Um, and east-west, it, it goes out as far as uh, you know, the, the Wichita Mountains out in, mm -hmm. near Lawton is kind of the about the furthest westernmost limit of the cross timbers in Oklahoma. Okay. Now, you told me a real interesting fact earlier about how these trees reproduce. And, of course, we all think it's egg corns, but you said they actually don't. Yes. germinate frequently. Mm -hmm. So both post oak and blackjack mm -hmm. they produce a lot of acorns but as far as we can tell they uh, really don't do much more than feed the squirrels. Mm -hmm. um, the Most of the reproduction from these trees is comes from sprouting either uh, from uh, sprouts originating from the root collar around the base of the tree or mm -hmm. just uh, sprouts, uh, uh, sprouts are arising from uh, lateral roots. Mm -hmm. So and that really constitutes you know, probably in excess of 99% of the reproduction. So all these little saplings and stuff out yeah. here, these are all just sprouts coming off these trees. So it's conceivable that all these trees uh, really are, in fact, the same individual, that they're all just sprouts off of each other. Really fascinating. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of your work has been with fire. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me about what you've learned about fire and the cross timbers. Yeah, so fire is a really important mm -hmm. uh, part of the system. Both post oak and blackjack oak are very mm -hmm. fire tolerant. They have thick bark that protects them from the heat of the fire and allows them to uh, uh, maintain or to persist even, even when fires occur. Um, they also, as we mentioned, sprout prolifically and so that helps them to keep themselves maintained in fire. And fire's really been, as far as we can tell, a very important part of the system mm -hmm. for a very long time. There's been fire history reconstructions using fire scars recorded in these tree rings that have allowed us to look back two or three hundred years and we see that fire has been occurring very regularly uh, in some instances as frequent as every you know three to five years. You have a tree ring here. Um, can you show us where you might see a fire? What are you looking for in here? Yeah, so mm -hmm. this here is a, is a good example of a fire scar. So mm -hmm. it's an area where the heat of the fire uh, killed the cambial tissue, mm -hmm. uh, which is the living tissue that's underneath the bark. And uh, in response to that, the tree grew new wood to cover up that dead spot. And there's a few places on this particular uh, cross section where you can see that this tree was scarred by fires. Okay. Now, of course, you can look at this on a dead tree, but how do you study living trees? How do you collect this kind of information? Uh, well, there's a uh, of course, if you need the whole cross section like you would for mm -hmm. uh, a fire history, um, you would do a lot of chainsaw work. <laughs> but uh, a, more, a less destructive method mm -hmm. is to use what we call an uh, increment bore. And this is a, just a simple tool, basically mm -hmm. composed of a handle and a hollow drill bit. And you just use this, uh, uh, you just uh, drill it into the tree. And then once you reach the desired depth, you stick this into the back spin around and break off the core and pull it out. And then you can see a, a miniature cross section. Yeah, basically. so basically you're getting a pencil thin mm -hmm. strip of wood that you can then look at the tree ring record from. Well, it's a really fascinating habitat and I'm sure it's been a lot of uh, fun to study. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. really an amazing system and kind of one that's been unappreciated and, and it's exciting to see more people taking an interest in it and, and starting to do more research and, and work in this area. Yeah, and it's nice that we have the ancient forest here so we can all get Certainly. a yes. good look at it. Thank you very much. The Keystone Ancient Forest is open the second Saturday of each month from 8 a.m. until 2 p.m. Visit their website for more information.